Good morning boys and girls. Today I want to show you a short video about a homeless man who sat down outside a church. Let's just see what happened. So you saw lots of different reactions there. Some didn't care and walked straight past him. Others thought about helping them, but then they walked away. Some stopped and prayed with him. Others gave him something like food or drink or money. Eventually, he packed up and walked away. But where did he go then? Well, he walked into the church, pushing his shopping trolley. But then he continued walking all the way up to the stage. And then, surprise, he removed his gloves his false beard, his false hair, and his dirty clothing. That shocked the church members because they began to realize that this man was not some homeless stranger out there. He was their pastor. Now you may ask, why did he play that trick on his church members? He wanted to test them. He wanted to see if they had any of that love and compassion that he preached about for many years. Did they have it inside them to help this poor homeless man? Jesus said that how we treat the poorest, most helpless people in society shows exactly how much of God's love we have in our own hearts. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 that if you only love those who love you, then that's not so special because even bad people do that. But if you can love people who don't love you, then that makes you special because only God can give you that type of love. It shows that you have God's love in your heart. It's easy to give things to people who give things to you. And we do that every Christmas, don't we? But can you give gifts to people who don't like you or who don't love you? In fact, can you give gifts to people who actually hate you? Ah, that makes you special if you can do that. There may be some people like that at school. People that no one talks to or people that no one likes. But notice that Jesus spent his life here on earth helping people just like that. People who were covered with ugly leprosy. 
people who are crippled or disabled. Those people crushed by lives of sin and wickedness. We couldn't take it anymore. Before we leave home each day, let's ask God to put his great love inside us. Let's ask God to help us display his love to everyone when we meet that day. You may be the only person they ever meet who has given them a glimpse of God's love for them. You can change the world person by person by displaying God's love in your heart each day. Well, let me say hello to you again, uh, brothers and sisters, friends. I'm so glad you're joining with me uh, as we come to that time where we are about to hear a message from the Word of God. And I just trust that you've had a good week. There's some good news on the horizon, uh, if you haven't heard already, but uh, those restrictions are lessening even more. I believe that from Monday next week we can have... 50 people gathering together in churches. Of course, things like social distancing still applies and there may be some other things that apply. And so I look forward to meeting with the board um, on Monday night to discuss uh, that as one of our items as well uh, in regard to the opening of the church. And of course, here at Hoxham Park Church, we have, uh, we have many more than, than just 50, isn't that right? So we have a, a much bigger church. And so we'll take that into consideration and uh, just keep the, the ministry leaders in prayer, please, and please keep the elders in prayer as well. For those of you who don't know me, as I'm speaking, my name's Pastor Andrew Russell. I'm the resident pastor of the Hoxham Park Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Sydney, and I'm so glad that you've joined us as well. Well, may God bless you now as we open up his word. Um, why don't you just bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our loving Father, Lord, we are still broadcasting, Father. We are still um, using our social media, Father, to share your word. And uh, Lord, I think of uh, one of the verses in the book of Daniel, Lord, that says that at the end of time, Lord, there in Daniel 12, knowledge, knowledge shall increase. And it certainly has, Father, in terms of technology and so forth. But with that, Lord, should increase the knowledge of your word, the knowledge of your salvation. In Christ, Father, because we have these, these, uh, these technological means at our disposal. I'm just so thankful that we can connect in this way. And so, Father, though we may not be seeing each other in person, I just pray, Lord, that we would be blessed by your word today and we would be blessed knowing that we are a, a community of faith knit together. And uh, among us, Lord, there are those that are seeking. Among us, there are those that have been walking with the Lord for some time. But Lord, we believe that you have prepared a blessing for us now. And so grant us your Holy Spirit, Father, and give us ears to hear, eyes to see, Father, and a will, Father, to choose life through you. And we thank you, Father, for that gift of eternal life that comes through Jesus. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the title of our message today is Beware of false revivals. Beware of false revivals. And that's going to be our topic today. And as we begin, I'm going to just invite you right away just to open up your Bibles with me so we can read this opening scripture together. It's found in Genesis chapter 11. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 11. And I want to, to read with me about the account of the, uh, 
uh, building of the Tower of Babel. And this is just to uh, give us a little bit of direction as we continue with our message today. And if you've noticed, I've been spending a bit of time in the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. And that's because these messages are saving messages for our time. What are they, everyone? They're saving messages. In other words, these are the messages that God wants us to know and understand and share with the world. These are the messages that bring in the second coming of Jesus Christ. These are the messages that prepare us for that second coming uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these are the messages that show us like never before that we are at the very end of time. The last moments, and I'm quoting from Ellen White, the last moments will be rapid ones. So friends, these messages are so vital for you and for me. And you know, one of the struggles I had with coronavirus was whether I, do I preach these messages now when we're not meeting in the church or do I wait for everyone to gather together? Well, the Lord has said, no, Andrew, continue, continue with the work, continue with the messages and these three angels' messages in particular. And so I'm continuing with this, uh, with our focus on some of these um, last day events, if you like, in the context of Bible prophecy. So let us get that direction now. Let's look at Genesis chapter 11. And let's read Genesis chapter 11, verse 4 to 7, first of all, and then verse 9. And notice what the Bible says here. And they said, and these are the people of the time, go to let us make brick and, sorry, go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto where? Unto heaven. And let us make us a name, let us, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And notice verse 5 talks about God's response here. It says, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. In other words, God's saying, because they're doing this now, it, it becomes now limitless what they would do. They, they, there's, there's no restraint. And in what they're doing, they're showing no restraint. So it can't be good what they're doing, is it? And verse 7 says, Go to let us go down there, confound and confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Bible says that, that God's confounded their language and He scattered them abroad. In verse 8, Sorry, verse 9 says, Therefore is the name of it called, what? Babel. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. See, the Bible here is giving us a historical uh, account of a time after the flood, sometime after the flood, when some of the descendants of Noah began to reject the claims of the living God. Okay? Now they knew about God. Noah had passed on that information to, his, uh, to, you know, to the generations that followed and through his children. But there came a time when some of those descendants of Noah began to reject the claims of God. And what are the claims of God, my friends? People can reject those claims today. Well, those claims are the fact that He is in fact the Creator, that He is the author of all creation that He is a God of love, that He is a God of, of, um, of, of justice and mercy and so forth. Uh, he's, he has His commandments and so forth, that, that he, he rules with all His kingdom and, and so uh, maintains peace and order in His kingdom. The, this, he, these are the claims that God has as Creator. And so they began to reject the claims of the living God and instead the Bible says that they began to choose to make a name for themselves. And so they designed and, and began to build this great city and a tower that the Bible said would, would reach all the way up to heaven. That's what they said, you know, or into the heavens, okay, meaning the skies. And so they wanted to erect this, this great tower and it would be such a magnificent structure that it would be the great wonder of the world at that time. You know, uh, I remember in, um, in around, uh, let me think, 1998, uh, Kim, my wife Kim and I, we worked at a great tower and we worked at the Sydney Tower right here in Sydney, Australia. 
And that tower stood 1,000 feet tall. And I remember working up there, we worked on the observation deck, we were tour guides, but I mean, looking from the observation deck was, you know, looking out was quite awesome. And we were so high, tallest structure in Sydney. And, you know, you could just imagine, and, and we really thought how, you know, what, what splendor this tower was built. Uh, and, you know, the interesting thing about that tower is that it was made to withstand earthquakes and, um, and even, even quite violent winds and wind gusts and so forth. You know, the, and I remember being up there sometimes and, and when the wind was really strong, you could just feel that tower swaying ever so slightly, moving backwards and forwards in the wind. Uh, I'm sure that some of you here listening may have had the opportunity to visit Sydney Tower. But what I do recall is at that time we were given a chart and we were given a chart that showed all the, all the tallest structures of the world. And I remember looking at that and it seemed as though men were racing or all the different cities in, in many of the cities of the world, men were racing to, ta to have ownership of the tallest structure in the world. And so, uh, and so um, I remember here in Sydney, the AWA Tower used to be the tallest structure in Sydney um, many years ago, and uh, when you, you can see it from Sydney Town, it just looks so small now. But across the world, people have always been building greater and greater structures, and men have been glorifying in their ability to, to get some kind of status through, you know, through the marvel of design and, and through their efforts to have and own the tallest structure in the world. Um, you know, I remember that the CN Tower in Toronto was the tallest structure in the world when I worked at Sydney Tower. Today it's not. There's been nine taller towers built since then. Currently, the, the Burj Khalifa of Dubai stands at almost triple the height of the Sydney Tower. It stands at 2,722 feet. Isn't that incredible? And you can see the difference in the, in the images I share there with you of the Sydney Tower and the Burj Khalifa Tower. So the story of the Tower of Babel is a, is a record of a time when men began to reject the claims of God and wanted to make their own name and they built this huge tower. And, you know, that is just a symbol of how men begin to, to invest in themselves. And they begin to rely on themselves. And the Bible says that the Lord came down to see what they were doing because he realized that in doing this, they were capable of anything. You see, it was always God's plan. And beyond the flood as well, that men would, would, would spread across the earth and carry the gospel of Jesus Christ with them to every part of the earth where they went. But they said, no, we don't want to do that. We want to, we want to build our own city and we want to have our own tower and we want to build it so high that if God even tries to bring a flood again, you know, we'll be able to rise above it all. And so this is what the Bible gives as an account. And you know, at the end of the day, they ended up with idolatrous practices as well. Um, you see, what we need to realize is that when men begin to reject the claims of God, anything becomes possible. They are capable of anything. God brings into our life accountability. God brings into our life a, a, a right and true purpose. But when men begin to reject the claims of God, they uh, effectively um, reject accountability and choose to go their own way. And my friends, when you choose to resist the work of, of the Holy Spirit, when you choose to resist God, then we give ourselves over to another power. And the building of the Tower of Babel is an example of that. And when we move on then in the scriptures, we, we come to the time of the tower, uh, sorry, to, to, the, to the image, I should say, that a king, a Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar erected. And so, you know, Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon, we read in the book of Daniel, stood where the Tower of Babel originally stood. And so we read in, in the book of Daniel now, we read about a time again where a king and the, Bab and the kingdom of Babel, uh, Babylon rejected the knowledge and the claims of the living God. 
the God of Israel. And in the end, the king Nebuchadnezzar, now he, he built himself a tremendous golden image and he called everyone to worship. And so we have that example there again of a time when men were rejecting the claims and the knowledge of God. And so my friends, I share that with you as a foundation because the Bible goes on to tell us that at the very end of time, that, that Babylon comes on the scene and the, and the Bible uses the word Babylon, not in the literal sense. Did you hear me? Not in the literal sense. There are some that believe that when we read about Babylon in the book of Revelation, that it's used in the literal sense. And so they begin to look to the country of Iraq to see what things are happening over there. Because that's where the city of Babylon once was. But that's not the purpose. The book of Revelation employs the name Babylon on a symbolic basis because it's trying to present, God is trying to foretell and God is foretelling and he's trying to tell that, that there would come a time when even within the church men would begin to reject the claims of God. And what would take place then is that that would give way to a to a false system of beliefs and a false system of religion and a false system of revival. And I want to take you to that. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Now I've studied some of this out with you in the past, but I just want you to notice that in the context um, of Revelation chapter 13 here, we are presented with two beast powers and those beast powers are the papacy being the first beast or Roman papalism, and the second beast is the United States of America. And so let's read Revelation 13, verse 11 to 14. And I want you to notice here, as it goes on, listen to this. Verse 11 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, of course, which is the Roman papacy. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceives them, underscore that word, deceives, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those, what everyone? Of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them, that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And so Revelation 13 lays the foundation for um, also Revelation chapter 14. Notice with me just quickly Revelation chapter 14 and uh, look at verse Look at verse 8 and 9. It says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Notice there, Babylon is mentioned. And that's why I said to you, uh, in the context of Revelation and these end time messages, Babylon is used not in a literal sense, but it's used as a symbol of when men who knowing the living God and knowing the claims of God begin to fall away from him, begin to reject those claims. Verse 9 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. And so here we, the world is brought now into the worship of the Antichrist power. And how does it happen, my friends? It happens when men begin to reject the claims of God. And so as we, as we go back now to Revelation 13 and we talk about this, this beast rising up out of the earth and it has, um, it has power. Uh, he, sorry, verse 12 said he exercises all the power of the first beast and he causes the world to worship the first beast. I just want to reiterate that it's very clearly uh, alluding to the United States of America. And uh, I've, I'll just touch on this just briefly with you again so that you can uh, make the connection. You see, there are really three points that are made here. The first is that it comes up out of the earth. Okay, The first beast of Revelation 13 comes up out of the sea. Revelation chapter 17, 15 tells us that water is a symbol of multitudes and nations and tongues and people. So the, Bible, uh, so the book of Revelation employs a lot of symbols, but we do not need to guess what those symbols are because the Bible gives us its 
own interpretation. And so whereas the papacy rose up in a very populated area being the European, uh, around the European nations there, lots of people rising up out of the sea, multitudes of nations, tongues and people, this second beast rises up not out of the sea but out of the earth. So it is in direct, um, it's a direct opposite to a populated place. And the Bible is identifying a nation that's rising up out of the earth here. The earth, though, is also an allusion to Revelation chapter 12, verse 16, because Revelation 12 speaks about God's church uh, prophetically from the time of Christ right down to the end of time until you get to the remnant, which is the last remainder of God's church. But remember, Revelation 12 talks about a persecuting of that church for 1260 years, which again we've looked at, which was Roman Catholicism persecuting Protestantism. Okay, and, and that's what took place for 1260 years until we get to Revelation 12 verse 16, which said, and the earth helped the woman. And if you remember what took place there, uh, the Roman pap papacy ruled from 538 AD all the way through to 1798 when it received a deadly wound. And that was one of the other identifying marks here in Revelation 13 verse 12. Look at the end of verse 12. It says, which he causes the, the earth and all, that, that, um, all them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose, whose deadly wound was healed. And early in Revelation 10 talked about the papacy receiving a deadly wound. And of course, that was with Napoleon Bonaparte in 1798 when he threw the Pope in prison and he removed political power from the papacy. In other words, the, the papacy lost all political power and it only existed as a church. When I refer to papal Rome, when I use that term, I'm, I'm referring to papal Rome both in its political and its religious sphere, okay, because it is both political and religious. Um, when, I ref when I say the um, Catholicism or the Ca Roman Catholic Church, you know we're referring to the religious aspect, okay, only. And so we've got to remember that Papal Rome had both political and religious clout. And uh, Emperor Justinian gave that, that uh, authority to the, the Bishop of Rome back in 538 AD under the Code of Justinian. And from 538 AD all the way through 1260 years brings us to 1798. And so the Bible is indicating that at that time there is another beast arising up out of the earth. And when you look at the history of the United States of America, friends, you'll notice that that America in that late 1700s period and, and, and on into the early 1800s was, was the time when it was formulating its constitution and it was coming up as, as the superpower laying its foundations for what would be and what we know today as the greatest superpower in the world. Is that clear everyone? And so we see today that the United States of America has tremendous influence across the world. And that's why the Bible identifies the United States of America as that power that would lend itself to support the worshipping of Rome and, uh, and the mark of the beast, which we've talked about, which is Sunday sacredness. So that's what I wanted to do first, just to identify that with you, for you again. But I want you to notice again how the Bible turns its attention to a false religious uh, revival at the time. And notice it says here again in Revelation chapter 13, verse 13 to 14, speaking now in the context of America. And he doeth great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those, what? Miracles. So my friends, the Bible is now is, is indicating that within the context of the United States of America, there will be these miracles and, and great signs and wonders that will be done. But the purpose of those miracles is to what? Is to deceive. Then that tells us something very important, doesn't it? That tells us that these miracles are not from the Lord God Himself. Because God is not in the business of deceiving. God is not in the business of forcing but the devil is. But the devil is. And so we want to, if we want to clarify that a little bit more, I want you to turn with me and let's find out who is actually performing these miracles. Let's go to Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. Notice Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. 
And notice it says here, as John sees in vision, now these end time events. And I saw three, what everyone? Unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And notice what these unclean spirits are doing. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So, so where are these miracles coming, up, coming from, friends? Well, they're coming from the spirits of devils, isn't that right? Which are working miracles, unclean spirits. That's what we're looking at here. Oh, my friends, unclean spirits are fallen angels. Because Satan caused a rebellion in heaven and a third of the angels lost their first estate, the Bible says, along with, with uh, Lucifer himself. And you remember Revelation um, 12 says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. There is a warning, my friends, to you and I. And people don't realize this. Uh, and, and yet we do things and we do the wrong things and men are performing the most heinous acts of crime and, and grievous acts toward their neighbor. And, and we just look and we just go, why? And, and we listen to some of those men in their testimonies and what do they say? I, I heard voices, something made me do it. Remember Christ came to cast out devils out of people, friends. And the Bible says we're not wrestling with the flesh, we're wrestling against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness in high places. And the devil is tempting and tempting and tempting man to continue in a course of evil that he knows will lead to their destruction. And he oppresses and he even possesses friends. And I just think it's foolish how some people think it's, it's all make-believe. It's just what people say. It's, you know, there's no truth to it. That's what the Bible says. It's the fool that says in his heart that there is no God. Be foolish, friends. We are not wrestling with the flesh. We're not wrestling with, our, with ourselves and with each other. We are wrestling against the spirits of devils. And the Bible says they go into all the earth. Now, my friends, you notice carefully there, it says they came out of the mouth of the dragon, verse 13, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the what? The false prophet. Out of the mouth, false prophet. So in the context of this, of this message that extends from Revelation 12, Revelation 13, 14, 15, 16, how are we to understand that? Well, it's very clear that God has identified those two beast powers for us in Revelation 13. One being the Roman papacy, two being the United States of America. Well, we know who the dragon is, friends, don't we? Because Revelation 12, verse 7 to 9 tells us very clearly that the dragon is Satan, the devil who rebelled in heaven. And so, so these unclean spirits come out of the mouth of the dragon, but it also comes out of the mouth of the beast. What's a beast a symbol of? Again, a nation, isn't it? That's why we're talking about um, these kingdoms. And so, it com so coming out of the mouth of the beast means it's coming out of the mouth of the Roman papacy. And, and who was the next kingdom to come up? At the time of the papacy receiving his deadly wound, that was the United States of America. So in the context of, of Revelation 13, working miracles in the United States of America, and the United States of America is now presented as in the context of being a false prophet. But here's the thing, my friends, here's what we need to understand. When we're talking about miracles and we're talking about uh, a prophet, are we talking about it in the context of politics or in the context of religion? Well, very clearly we're talking about it in the context of religion, aren't we? And when we put that in context of the church, which once upon a time left Europe and escaped, remember Revelation 12, the persecuted woman? She was persecuted, but the earth helped the woman. The history tells us that the persecuted Protestants uh, left Europe and they went to the newfound land that would later become the United States of America. And there they found freedom from religious intolerance. There they found they found religious liberty there. And there were even some Catholics that joined them because there were Catholics that believed in religious liberty. They didn't agree with the, with the forcing of, of religious uh, conscience. They agreed with religious liberty. But America was founded upon those principles. 
and the majority were Protestants that founded America. And so what was a good thing, my friends, when we read in the context of the first beast of Revelation 13, notice here with me again, notice in verse 11, when it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a what? Like a lamb. So notice the lamb is a reference to, to Christ. Horns are a reference to power. If you look in Daniel 7, ten horns, right? Referring to ten kingdoms or ten powers that would arise. And so here we have uh, America rising up, providing a safe haven for the church, employing proper biblical principles of freedom okay, and liberty. It rose up upon Christian principles, and that's what made America such a great nation. But it went on to say that he would speak as a what? As a dragon. And my friends, what the Bible is indicating here, that, is with, that, that there will, something is happening in the church. In America, the Bible is indicating that there, there are the working of miracles and, and unclean spirits are coming in and doing miracles to deceive, my friends. And who does, the, who does the devil want to deceive? Who does the devil want to deceive, my friends, except those who follow the Word of God? Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And so he comes to deceive God's people. And, and, and this is what the Bible is talking about. And we find out that what started well, and, and the many Protestant churches that were there, that, that things would change, my friends. And instead of a true prophet, we are present with a symbol of a false prophet, symbolizing that Protestantism would move into apostasy. And that's synonymous with Paul's claim in the book of Thessalonians when he says there shall come a great falling away. Isn't that right? A great apostasia in the Greek, a great apostasy, speaking about what would happen right before Christ would return. And so we're dealing with now the church venturing into a place that, that it begins to reject the claims of God, my friends, and we end up not with Protestantism, but with apostate Protestantism in the United States of America. You know that word Protestant used to mean something once upon a time. It used to mean something. It means that we protest against anything that comes against the Word of God. In other words, we'll stand firm on truth. We'll stand firm on the claims of God. But are Protestants protesting today? You know, Protestants for centuries pointed out the falsehoods of the papacy and its idolatrous practices. And they were a persecuted people. That's why we have so many churches today, my friends, because many of them were bro broke away, people who broke away from the Roman Catholic Church and, and said, no, the Word of God says this, and you're teaching that. But the Bible says, and the Bible is foretelling that things would begin to change. The spirits of devils will work miracles and deceive within the churches of America and then across the world. You know, probably one of the things that are most evident today uh, and that has been evident for a number of years now uh, was the charismatic movement. Heard of the charismatic movement? And my friends, I want you to know that I am not condemning any people. That's not our... Jesus didn't come to condemn, my friends. The Bible says, and Jesus said, He came to save. But the truth helps us to know what God sees. See, in the time of the Tower of Babel, God came down to see what was taking place. You remember that? And my friends, God comes down and He looks and sees what is happening in the churches today. And he sees that, the, that there's so many different churches, thousands and thousands of different churches professing to be Christian. And they don't all practice the same things and they don't all believe the same things, friends. Sad to say. And many people are being turned away because of it. Let me read to you an article from the spreading of the charismatic renewal. Okay, that was the title, Spreading of the Charismatic Renewal from uh, the magazine Christianity Today. It says the Pentecostal movement in the early 1900s grew to about 50 million by 1950. And then it exploded with the charismatic renewal coming into the mainline traditions. Notice this now. The mainline traditions. 
in the 60s and 70s, the growth in the time affected Anglicans, Lutherans, Orthodox and Reformed, and even Roman Catholics. You notice now, those traditional Protestant churches have been affected by this Pentecostal movement, this charismatic renewal. Notice it goes on to say the emphasis on the baptism or filling of the Holy Spirit and charismatic gifts began to spread quickly through mainline denominations throughout the 1960s and 70s, though much of the belief and practice of the charismatic movement came directly from the Pentecostals. The mainline churches who embraced such belief avoided the Pentecostal label for both cultural and theological reasons. In other words, my friends, this was, this was coming at such a pace and, and pe so many people were jumping on board that, that even mainline traditional churches didn't know what to do with it. And many of them, they embraced it, friends. And I've heard personal testimonies from some of those who, who, in those churches who know the Bible who, who said, what is happening to our church? This is unlike anything we, we've ever known before. It goes on to say movements were born in each of those denominations. Episcopalians had faith alive. Acts 29, not the church planting network, but the Episcop sorry, Episcopal group. The Southern Baptists had the fullness movement and the Lutherans had ARC and more. Africans, uh, Af sorry, Africa's Anglicans are one of the groups deeply influenced by the charismatic movement. And my friends, I know... Uh, African Christians that, that say to me, Pastor, and someone said it to me recently, they're from Zimbabwe, and they said, Pastor, we've got all these, these people springing up in Africa, these self-proclaimed prophets, and they, and they claim to be baptizing with the Holy Spirit. They, they claim to have the baptism of fire. And some of you know what I'm talking about. And even those outside of the church know what I'm talking about. You've seen some of that. You've seen churches where people are, are jumping around and, and falling over all over the place. Some, of, some people have seen some people barking like dogs on all fours in the so-called church under this so-called baptism of the Holy Spirit, my friends. And the place of the sanctuary, the place of worship, which was once holy, to God and, and if you look at the, the sanctuary in the context of the uh, of temple worship in, in the Bible my friends it was a solemn service it was a place of holiness it was a place of reverence and the Bible calls us to worship him in the beauty of holiness and yet we see people barking like dogs in the church falling over in the pews falling over on the floor in the front of the church speaking in what they call tongues. I don't call it tongues, my friends, because the Bible has a different version of what tongues is. I call it babble. Just like the babble from the time of Babel, when God confounded the language, when people listened to it, it sounded like babble, and that's what came into the churches, even many of the mainline Protestant churches. And many were unsure as to what to do. They couldn't stop it, friends. And many of the, the, the younger generation in those Protestant churches said, we, we need this, we need to do this, we, this is more attractive, we need, to be, uh, we need to be more appealing to the world and more appealing to the young people. And so we want this in our churches. And, and churches even divided over these things. Churches split over these things. I remember visiting uh, my cousin in South Africa and, uh, and her husband. At the time, he invited me to come to his Baptist church. Now, there wasn't a service. It was a, a, um, a youth night that night, and he was doing security that night volu volunteer, voluntarily. And so I said, okay, I'll come and join you. I don't know what I was thinking. I was on holiday, and South Africa is not the safest place, uh, you know, in some of those areas. But I went with him. And while I was there, he said, why don't you go inside and have a look around? And so I did. And my friends, as I, I noticed... Uh, the worship service was far different to what I expected. And the, and, and the young people, my friends, they were, they were break dancing at the front of the church. They were hip hopping at the front of the church to Christian hip hop. And I was taken back by what I was seeing. And they were talking about worshiping God and so forth. And, and when I came out, my friends, and I spoke with him, he said... Uh, 
He said, what do you think? And I said, well, nice building. I said, the only one thing the, that when I look at the top of the building, the name says Baptist Church. But what I see inside looks more like a charismatic church than a Baptist church. And he hung his head. He was one of those that felt helpless to do anything. And he said, never used to be like that. My friends, the, the, the church has become a place of entertainment. Sensationalism. Rock concerts. Christian, Christian rock. Christian hip hop. Christian heavy metal. Where does it stop, my friends? And then we say, because, it's, because I, I, I'm, I'm singing to the Lord, therefore it's acceptable. My friends, this is a false revival that has been taken place. This is not of the Spirit, my friends. This is of the Spirit of the devil. And I know it's not popular, perhaps what I'm saying here, but my friends, it's the truth. If you don't believe me, my friends, go and look at some uh, footage and jump on YouTube and look at, look at things like kundalini spirits. Look at it and notice that what's happening in Eastern mystic religions, like in India and so forth, where people, is, is happening in the church where people are, are jumping around, people are falling over, my friends, people are, are speaking in Babel. I remember visiting a Pentecostal church and I was... Uh, Visiting there for a while, had some friends there. And I remember one of the, the husbands of, of a lady, um, you know, he had supposedly spoken in tongues that morning. You see, they believed that to speak in this, in this unknown tongue, this Babel, was a sign that you had the Holy Spirit. And they'd been praying and praying and praying for him. And he wanted it and he wanted it. And my friends, he got it. And I remember walking away from there thinking, is that, is that what I'm supposed to have too? Is that from God? I was still a young Christian then. I didn't know much. And I remember going home and saying, God, if, that, if that's from you, God, that so-called tongues where they're speaking, blah, 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 and whatever else they may be speaking, if that's from you, God, give it to me. But if it's not from you, God, I don't want it. I never got it. And my friends, I want to I share with you... Um, I'm going to share with you something about tongues. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Oh, it's very important that we understand these things. We need to know what the Bible foretold would happen within, within the house of God. And you remember when Christ came the first time, he found the house of God in a terrible state. So terrible was the state that, that the, the church at the time rejected the claims of God. Isn't that right? And what did they do? They rejected Christ and they crucified him. And my friends, we're in danger of doing the same thing. These are signs of the second coming of Christ as well. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and notice what it says. This is the biblical understanding of tongues, my friends. Let's read verse 22 and verse 23. It says here, and Paul writes to the church in Corinth, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, not for the church members, my friends, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serves not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. The gift of prophecy is for the church, is for believers. But tongues is not for believers, it's for the unbelievers. Verse 23 says, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you are mad? I had a friend of mine, Yolanda, that visited a, a Pentecostal church over on the North Shore. Um, and, uh, and visiting there, they began to speak in tongues. And, and you know what she did, my friend? She ran out of the church. That's exactly what the Bible said would happen if people all spoke in tongues and people couldn't understand. She wondered if they were mad. What's going on here? And notice as it goes on, now let's read verse 27, verse 28. And I want you to, to know that when the Bible speaks about tongues here, it's actually the original, uh, in the original language, it means glossa and dialectos. That's the, true, the two translations uh, of, of the word tongues 
in the Greek, glossa and dialectos. Okay, glossa means your, your native tongue, a dialectos means a different dialect. And, and that gift was given so that the church and the apostles could preach the gospel and people of different dialects could understand in their own language, my friends, not in an unknown tongue, okay? And so notice it goes on in verse 27 and verse 28. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, notice that's uh, hyphenated, uh, sorry, um, italic, sorry, let it be by two, at the most by three, and that by course, and let one what? Interpret. So in other words, if God gives you the gift of tongues, and so you have a Greek person come along, okay? That person who, who may be an unbeliever will be able to understand the gospel, okay? But if you're going to speak, right, uh, in an unknown tongue, let there be an interpreter because someone needs to be able to interpret for those who may not understand Greek. Okay, that's the context here. And at most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Verse 28 says, but if there be no interpreter, what are interpreters used for, my friends? Interpreters are used to interpret a language on behalf of someone else. Isn't that right? Let him keep silence. If there's no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So my friends, very clear, the gift of tongues was for the preaching of the gospel. It was not an unknown tongue in the sense that it's an unknown language. And yet people are claiming that's from the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have that gift, you haven't had the Holy Spirit. That's what I saw. Oh, my friends, you get the Holy Spirit as soon as you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, even those who haven't come to faith, the Holy Spirit is pleading with them, striving with their consciousness, calling them to know their God, their Creator, His mercies and His love. Calling them to know the sacrifice of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is at work, my friends. I want you to um, notice how Sister White describes such movements. She noticed some of these movements in her day. Listen to what she says here. She says, uh, this is from Great Controversy, page 463 to 464. Popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to the imagination, by exciting the emotions, by gratifying the love for what is new and startling. Converts thus gained have little desire to listen to Bible truth, little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles. So what are popular revivals? What are they characterized by? Exciting the emotions, gratifying the love for what is new and startling. But in that, the people have little desire to listen to Bible truth. Little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles. She goes on to say, unless a religious service has something of a sensational character, it has no attractions for them. A message which appeals to unimpassioned reason awakens no response. The plain warnings of God's word relating directly to their eternal interests are unheeded. Could it be that's why we don't have many people um, or I shouldn't say many, but that, could that be why we don't have people attending church today? Because it has no appealing quality. They're looking for something more sensational. They're looking for something more entertaining. And that's because they're, they're, they're involved in the world. They're being entertained by the world. They're, being, they're, they're following the sensationalism of the world. And when it comes to the religion of Christ, it's deemed as boring. Oh, my friends, if that's you, my friends, God is calling you. God is letting you know that something is out of place, that something is wrong. The devil, the, the, the spirits of devils have been working, friends, in your life. But God wants to give you the Holy Spirit, the spirit that delights in the simple things, the simple things that relate to life, eternal life and godliness the things that transform the life so that it doesn't rely on all those things to be happy, my friends. It relies, your happiness relies purely on your relationship with a loving Savior, with your relationship with the Lord of creation and the Lord of redemption. 
And so God is calling you. Church is the house of God, my friends. This is where the family of God gathers. Come back into the fold. Come back into the fold. Come into repentance. But how is it, my friends, that the churches have, have ended up in this state? Let me share with you here another statement from Maranatha, page 190. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. What are those two errors? Immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. And of course, immortality of the soul is dealing with that, that, uh, that false teaching that when you die, you just go straight to heaven. No judgment, just go straight to heaven, right? Or maybe you go to hell. Or maybe you go into a place called purgatory and there you wait for your redemption and everyone's got to pray for you. My friends, these are unbiblical themes. We are not immortal. We are mortal, my friends. The Bible says that when we die, we will rest, we will sleep and we wait for the resurrection at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that Im Im immortality of the soul teaching comes out of spiritualism, friends. It comes out of false religions. And when you have that, my friends, everything else comes in from those false religions as well. False spirits come in, my friends. And Sunday sacredness, she says, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions because they have rejected the truth on these two items. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome because Sunday sacredness belongs to Rome. And Protestant churches need to realize that. The tradition of Sunday worship as opposed to the Sabbath that Christ kept. That Seventh-day Adventists keep. Even there are some Seventh-day Baptists that keep it. The latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. It goes on to say, The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf of, to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, that is the dragon, the beast and the false prophet, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. She, Sister White foresaw, and in the context of the Bible, we see that the United States will depart, my friends, and, and, re, and, and religious entities in the United States will depart from the plain claims of God's word, will depart from his commandments, will depart from the truth. And that's what brings about a false revival. Let's not rely on sensationalism. Let's not rely on entertainment in the church. Let us delight ourselves in the Lord. Amen. Let us delight ourselves in the Lord. There is a true revival that's contrasted with a false revival. Turn with me to Isaiah 57, verse 15. Notice here, Isaiah 57, verse 15. Notice what the Lord says here in His Word. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is what everyone? Holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a what? A contrite and humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrast ones. My friends, God is saying that, that those who come in humility, that those who behold him in his, in his great love and care for humanity, that those who behold him in his great sacrifice for humanity, those who come in humility, he will revive them. He will revive their hearts. This is true revival. Because the cross, my friends, teaches us that the claims of God stand the cross of Jesus is not only an emblem of mercy, it's an emblem of His justice, my friends, because He met the wages of sin. We'd broken His law and, and, we had, and, and man had to pay the debt of sin for breaking His law and Christ met that penalty on your behalf and my behalf. So the, the claims of the commandments stand, my friends. It's not done away with. It stands. The will of God and, and the claims of God stand, my friends, because of Calvary. And so we find mercy, and so we acknowledge that God has rightful claim over our lives because we are purchased with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so God will do the reviving. Turn me to Psalm chapter 80, verse 19. Psalm 80, verse 19. Notice what the Bible says here. Psalm 80, verse 19. And let's read together. Notice the appeal of the heart of the psalmist. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. Cause thy face to shine and we shall be what? We shall be saved. Lord, cause your face to shine upon us. Have mercy to us, Lord. And we will be revived. Amen? We will be revived. I don't know where you are in your relationship with God. But my friends, what you need is the Spirit of God. What you need is, is for God to revive you. Some of us have slipped so far away, my friends, we come to church and we're not even pre- we don't even have a presence of mind in the church. We're in church... But, but our mind is so far away sometimes, my friends. We're on our mobile phones sometimes. We're thinking of other things. And we're not exercising that spirit of humility where we could say with the psalmist, Turn us again, O Lord. O Lord God of hosts, cause your face to shine, and so we shall be saved. My friends, this is true revival. And our last text is found in, in Revelation. Revelation chapter 14. The Bible says, and it contrasts, it contrasts, my friends, um, those that experience revival with those that don't. And, and it says so in the context of the church. Remember, a woman in Bible prophecy is a symbol of the church. And not only in prophecy, but in, through the scriptures, God refers to his church as a woman. And listen to this in Revelation 40. Notice it says in verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the mount of Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. My friends, that's the character of God. That's the name of God, my friends. Not like the people of Babel who wanted to go and establish their own name. But the name of the Father was written in their foreheads. And notice as it goes on to say in verse 4, These are they which were not defiled with, what everyone? With women. Now this is symbolic, my friends. This is not literal women. This is talking about the churches. They are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which, what? Follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits, unto God and to the Lamb. And my friends, God has come down and He's seen and He's seen what the churches are doing, but He has a people that will not follow uh, uh, apostate teachings and apostate Protestantism, my friends. Have t- evil, they will follow what the Bible says and what the Bible clearly teaches. They follow the Lamb wherever He leads them. And so they have true revival. Is your heart surrendered to the Lord? When you wake up each day, are you, do you seek the Lord? Do you seek the Lord? I pray you are seeking the Lord. You know, many years ago, I uh, got invited to a Bible study at a friend's house. Uh, I was a fairly new Seventh-day Adventist at the time, and um, I wanted to share with him that Jesus was the Lord of the Sabbath, that the claims of God still stand. And he said, come around, come around when we have Bible study. And so I went around to his house. And instead of having the opportunity to speak to him, I, I realized that there was a full-blown church worship service about to take place in his home. He had opened up the garage into the side yard uh, running uh, down the side of the house. There were rows and rows of chairs there. There was a pulpit up the front. And, uh, and, I, and I got there and, um, and he said, come, come, come. And he took me and, and, and I, it, was as if, it was as if they had me being a visitor and knowing that I was a visitor, they were ready to convert me to the faith, to the church. And so they tried to usher me up to the front row so that I could sit right up the front there where the pastor was going to preach. And being new and the first time there and not realizing what's happening, I, um, 
I said, oh, it's okay, I'll just sit over here. And so I took more of a seat more in the middle somewhere. And I'll never forget, my friends, when that worship service started, the music began to play loud. The people began to jump around and wave their hands in the air. And, and it, it, was, it was as if they, were, they wanted to feel the touch of God. They wanted to literally feel the touch of God. My friends, that's sensationalism. But this is what I was introduced to. And, uh, you know, I, didn't, uh, I, I was not used to that environment. I, I, knew, I knew a more traditional approach to worship. I came from a, a background where we sang beautiful hymns and so forth. But here the music was, the, the Christian rock was blaring and the people were jumping. And, and you know, churches these days, they have, they have the, all these different lights going off in different colors and so forth. It's like a rock concert. I just want you to know what's happening and what's happened. And so uh, there I was and I just quietly stood there and I assumed a, a manner of, of contemplation. I thought, well, we're worshipping the Lord. I don't know these songs and the lyrics to these songs or, or, or all of them. And so I, I just began to pray with the Lord. I wasn't one to be jumping around. I didn't feel I needed to do that. Now, there's nothing wrong with raising your hands, my friends, and saying, praise the Lord. And I do that sometimes myself. Okay? Even when I pray at home, I just say, Lord, thank you so much for all you give me. Nothing wrong with that. But we're talking about sensationalism. And so I, I stood there and... Um, and I meditated on some of the words that I heard in the song, and I talked to my Lord, and, uh, and I must have stood out like a sore thumb, if you can imagine. And then the pastor, he started pre preaching, the music stopped, the pastor started preaching, and he was bellowing out the message, as, you know, uh, trumpeting it as loud as he could, and, and, and trying to be very, um, what we may call charismatic, as he was walking and trumpeting and... and he was hardly even referring to the Bible, my friends. I never opened the Bible once. Had my Bible next to me. And he was preaching and, and the people were shouting in response and it was very charismatic. Some began to speak in that unknown tongue or babble. And as I stood there, something happened. All of a sudden I felt what what I can only describe as electricity, touched the back of my neck and run up the back of my neck. And when I felt that, my friends, I thought, oh, what was that? And then I began to pray. And you know what my prayer was? I said, Father, Lord, you know, Lord, I only want to worship you in spirit and truth. And I know this is far different, Lord. And, and Lord, you've been teaching me some things about worship. And Lord, I don't know if this is from you, Lord, but you know, I only want your Holy Spirit, Lord. I only want your Spirit. And then I went on to say something else. I said, and Father, if there is any other Spirit here, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would just remove them, confound these spirits. And I, I just cannot really describe to you what happened next, my friends, but it's as if, it was as if something left the room. The whole atmosphere changed. And, and the people began to almost wonder why they were standing there with their hands waving. The, the pastor began to, to fumble his words and to the point where he didn't even know what he was saying anymore because it was all out of sensationalism, friends. It was all out of emotion and feeling. And I could see that he was struggling and I stood there quietly and I witnessed this. And having lost his way, my friends, he brought the, the service to an end. And when we walked out, I'll never forget my friend said to me, I don't know what just happened. It's not usually like that. Uh, just why don't you come next time again? And I share that with you, my friends, to let you know there is a false revival taking place and, and it, it, it's, it's sweeping through, it has swept through many churches and it's still there today. It's still there today. And it brings confusion with it, friends. And what you and I need more than anything else is the Word of God and a true revival 
through the true Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Amen? And if that's your desire, no matter where you are, all you need to say is, as the psalmist said, Lord, turn us, Lord. Cause your face to shine upon us. Cause your face to shine upon me, Lord, and so I will be saved. Won't you say that today? Let us, let us always work for a true revival in the church. Let us come to, Lord in, in, to the Lord in sincerity and in repentance, in humility. And let us, let us accept the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon us. God's Spirit. Let Him revive us, friends, and let Him keep us until the day of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank You, Lord, for, Lord, helping us to see, Father, what things would happen. Lord, we know, Lord, as You come down and You see things, Lord, Father, that it grieves you, Father. Lord, I get reports from people, even in the church, a lot of things that are happening around, Father, even sometimes what certain people in this Seventh-day Adventist church are doing, Lord. And we wonder why, Lord, and, and Father, just teach us to sigh and cry, Lord. Sigh and cry, Father, for your people. Oh, Father, remove the unclean spirits, Lord, from our lives. Father, we pray for those who, are, who are, have been caught up in these false religious revivals. Many of these tele-evangelists that we see on television, not preaching the gospel, Lord. Preaching sensationalism and lining their pockets. Lord, we pray for your people that are caught up in this. We pray for even those tele-evangelists, Lord, that they would experience a true conversion. That they would come to know your truth. And Father, turn your face that it may shine upon us. Grant us your mercy. Forgive us, Lord. And revive us, Father, we pray now. And we thank you, Lord, for your promise, Lord, to revive. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. I just want to say a very happy Sabbath to you. May God bless you for the rest of the Sabbath and may you Enjoy your time together. Remember that we have um, closing sundown worship as well. And uh, just click on those links that Yamera has sent around. Um, I'm enjoying spending time with the youth as well. And I'm just so thankful for all that we are doing uh, as we continue through this, this restricted time. So may God bless you and keep you. May he revive you and may he send you in his name is my prayer. Amen. Sebastian decided to give his life to Jesus in an unusual place, the soccer field. The Life Hope Center helped me have the Word of God in my heart. A few months before, he was excited when his parents Moises and Angelica signed him up for soccer lessons at the Global Mission Life Hope Center just down the street from their house. Sebastian worked hard at the lessons and his skills improved quickly, but soon he realized he was learning more than just soccer. Sebastian had met Jesus through the one year in mission volunteers serving this urban center of influence in Santiago, Chile. He felt like he needed to share his new love for Jesus with his parents. So each day after soccer lessons, while walking home with his parents, Sebastian told them about Jesus. It was around this time that Sebastian's grandmother got very sick. Sebastian was worried. During this difficult time, Pastor Abraham Cabezas who led the center's outreach programs, began regularly visiting the family with his team of one year in mission volunteers to pray with them and encourage them. Sebastian's parents enjoyed these visits and in time, they requested Bible studies. Eventually, the love of Jesus won their hearts and they were baptized. Soon, his grandmother regained her strength. The family is eternally grateful for the friendship and care shown by the one year in mission team. To this day, the volunteers selflessly give up their time to be lights of hope in the community.
We find these volunteers who are willing to give their gifts, talents and abilities to serve others. We have so many types of workshops, like cooking workshops, language workshops and exercise workshops that are used as an instrument, an opportunity to follow Christ's method. That is why through these workshops many people can mingle with Adventists and through their service they can know the Lord. Sebastian is so happy when he listens to his parents talk about their new lives. And here's why. So that we go to heaven. Thanks to your faithful support of Urban Centers of Influence, Sebastian's goal of having his family united in Christ has become an exciting reality. I want to express my gratitude to Global Mission for believing and trusting in these projects. At any moment, the King in Heaven will return and we will see the result of all of the effort from Chile and the whole world.